Welcome back, True Crime Army. I am your host, Margot, and this is Military Murder, a show where I focus on crimes committed by military members and veterans. But don't worry, you don't have to know anything about the military to listen, I promise. You just have to be a true crime enthusiast. And if that's you, welcome home. Johnny and Susie sitting on a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage. Then comes Susie with a baby carriage. Then everyone lives happily ever after. At least that's how it should go. But oftentimes it doesn't end like that at all. Sometimes families blend together. One person brings their kids and the other person brings their kids. And then you have a whole Brady Bunch situation. But what happens when both the wife and the husband are in the military? Do relationships stay faithful through long and drawn out deployments and temporary assignments? Sometimes they do, but sometimes they don't. Let's explore a dual military couple whose relationship ended in murder. But who would ultimately pay the price? And who would be held responsible? Join me today as I tell you the story of Sherry Malarick. Now, let's dig in. Military murder is an independent project and is not endorsed by the Department of Defense or any military component. The views expressed are those of the host. The content of this podcast is not meant to be legal or medical advice. Warning, this episode contains graphic details of murder and is not suitable for young listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Sherry Lynn Panzer was born on February 12, 1967, to parents Dennis and Maria Panzer. Born in San Diego, Sherry was raised in a military family. Sherry was very outgoing, and growing up, she was involved in a lot of extracurricular activities. It's not surprising to learn, then, that Sherry decided to follow in her family's footsteps when she joined the Navy. By the age of 23, Sherry found herself a single working mom to her son, Jacob. When Sherry got the opportunity to be stationed in Bermuda, Sherry was excited, and it was during her assignment in Bermuda that Sherry met Greg Malarick. He was also a single father to a son. Greg and Sherry decided to get married and blend their families, and in the summer of 1994, the pair was married. When they returned to the States, the Mallorys continued to enjoy their life as a dual military couple and eventually went on to add three more kids to the clan. They first had two more boys, and finally their last child was a baby girl. So it was a total of five kids, four boys and a little girl. Sherry loved being a mom. From everything that I read, she was like a modern mom before the age of social media. Her sister said that although Sherry was a working mom, she somehow managed to balance three soccer schedules, a full-time military career, and she meal prepped a month in advance. In fact, she even had her devoted weekly food shopping day, which typically fell on Wednesdays. Sherry would head to the grocery store in her red Dodge Caravan minivan because, listen, Minivan life is the amazing life for any family who has more than one child. Sherry would always go to the grocery store with a cooler for the meats and other perishables because as a mom of five, you really never know what quick errand you can run after going grocery shopping. Well, in every military relationship comes a time when one person in the relationship must deploy. And in the year 2000, Sherry's number was called. She was forward deployed to Greece for one year. Sherry was not happy about leaving behind her husband and five kids, but she was happy that Greg would be able to stay home and hold down the fort for a year without having to move the kids around. So in 2000, Sherry left her family behind to head to Greece. While in Greece, Sherry pretty much stayed to herself. She did her job and that was that. Meanwhile, back home, Greg was trying to manage the five kids between the ages of two and 10 which I can't imagine that that could be easy. But it seemed to work out for Greg as he was able to find a babysitter. It was actually one of his coworkers and she appeared to be very helpful and very nice. In May 2001, after Sherry returned home, she was thrilled to have the family reunited. And while Greg seemed a little bit distant, Sherry tried to rekindle the flames. But before the family could mesh back together post-deployment, tragedy struck. (laughs) 
On Friday, September 21st, 2001, just 10 days after the history of the United States was forever changed, and while the country was still mourning, the Malarick family had a lot to celebrate. For starters, Sherry was back home after a year-long deployment. The Malarick kids were having a giant sleepover with their cousins at the Malarick home in Pensacola, Florida, and Sherry's brother-in-law, Jeff Leake, had just been promoted to chief. So he and Sherry's sister, Tina Leake, that night, they were heading to a Navy ball, which is why they had the cousin sleepover. Basically, Sherry was babysitting her nieces and nephews. Anyway, at around 8 p.m., Greg Malarick called Tina Leake to see if she was with Sherry. Tina told Greg that no, her sister wasn't there. And Greg said he was just wondering because Sherry had ran out to buy some milk and hadn't returned. Tina didn't think anything of it, and her and her husband, Jeff, went to the Navy ball. When they returned that night, it was just after 11 p.m. when their phone rang again. Again, it was Greg Malarick, and he was wondering where his wife, Sherry, was. The leaks became a little worried, and Tina offered to pick up her kids. But Greg was like, don't worry about it. The kids are sleeping. I'll just follow up. The leaks offered to help Greg by calling the police stations and hospitals to see if they could find Sherry. But Greg, again, was like, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it. That night, the leaks went to sleep, and at 6 a.m., the phone rang again. This time, there was a little bit more urgency. It was Greg Malarick, and he wanted them to know that Sherry, his wife, had never returned with the milk. Tina and Jeff immediately jumped into action. Jeff grabbed his gun, and he drove around looking for Sherry or her car. Tina called her mom and her sisters and asked for prayers. Everyone was nervous. Sherry was the most responsible human they knew. One, if Sherry knew she was having a house full of kids for a sleepover, why wouldn't she have purchased milk earlier in the week? And two, why hadn't Sherry returned, knowing full well there was a house full of kids relying on her? Meanwhile, Jeff drove around for close to two hours looking mostly in the back roads when all of a sudden he spotted a red minivan. He did a double take and saw a minivan parked towards the back of the Winn-Dixie parking lot. The Winn-Dixie, for those of you who don't know, is a grocery store. Jeff drove into the parking lot and as he was looking at the minivan, it looked empty. He began to wonder if Sherry had, I don't know, been abducted. He parked behind the van and then walked over. And that's when he looked inside the minivan and saw Sherry. She was almost shoved down into the floorboard on the front passenger seat. Jeff ran to the passenger door and began banging on the door, asking Sherry to wake up. He saw the blood. The door was locked. He ran over to the driver's side door, which was unlocked. And when he opened it and touched Sherry, she was cold to the touch. And there was blood everywhere. He knew Sherry was gone. Jeff immediately started screaming for someone to call 911. And in the Dateline episode that I watched for this case, you can hear Jeff tell the operator, my sister-in-law is dead. Jeff was shook. Who could have killed Sherry? Authorities immediately arrived and Sherry was declared dead at the scene. Eventually, Sherry's sisters were notified that Sherry's car was found and shortly thereafter, Tina arrived on the scene. But when she saw her husband crying, sobbing, she knew her sister was gone. Their lives were forever changed and the kids, well, they were all still at Greg's house. They were excited about their cousin's sleepover and now a wonderful weekend turned into the most horrific moment of their lives. Investigator Buddy Neesmith was assigned to the case and he immediately took inventory of the crime scene. He believed that Sherry had been robbed since she wasn't wearing any of her rings and her purse and wallet were not found in the car. Also missing from the car was the car's radio. But there was something about this crime scene that looked personal. While initially authorities didn't reveal how Sherry had died, it later came out that Sherry had been shot in the head twice. At the scene, however, investigators only found one shell casing. Sherry had been shot with a 25 caliber gun. Of course, authorities wanted to speak to her husband, Greg. Tina went to the house, took all the kids back to her house, while Greg went down to the station. When Greg was down there, he replayed the previous night over with authorities, telling them that the day prior, the minivan had been overheating, and when all the kids were at the house for the sleepover, he had been out back and had been tinkering with the car, trying to figure out why it was overheating. A little after 7 p.m., Greg recalled Sherry came outside and said she needed to go to the grocery store for some milk, and she took the minivan and never returned. 
Authorities also spoke to the kids, at least the older kids, right? Jacob, who was Sherry's oldest son and he was 11 years old at the time, he remembered that that Friday night, all the kids had just sat down to eat dinner when Greg poked his head inside from outside and asked Sherry to come outside real quick. Sherry said something to the effect of, give me a minute, and then she went outside, but Sherry never returned. One of Tina's kids remembered that later after dinner, but before bedtime, she was in the corner of the room with her three-year-old cousin, Tara, Sherry's only daughter, and they were playing Barbies when there was a sudden knock at the door. The little girl remembered the knock scared her because it was dark outside and she hadn't been expecting anyone. The little girl didn't know who was at the door, but 11-year-old Jacob remembered that it was the babysitter, Jennifer. Authorities thought that was an interesting fact that they hadn't gathered from Greg. And when they asked him, he was like, oh yeah, that's right. Jennifer is our babysitter and also my coworker. And she stopped by that night to return the lawnmower she had borrowed previously. Jennifer Spone, it turned out, had stopped by sometime between 8 and 9 p.m. that evening. Investigators canvassed the area where Sherry's car was found, and they found a Winn-Dixie employee who said he remembered some people arguing in a minivan, but he didn't get a good look at the people. There were no cameras at the Winn-Dixie back in 2001, so investigators were hitting dead end after dead end. That is, until Sherry's sister was interviewed. This episode was made possible by EveryPlate. And right now, EveryPlate is offering $1.49 meals plus $1 steaks for life with my code 49MILITARYMAMA. I don't know if it's because my kids are getting a little bit older or what, but they have been devouring their EveryPlate meals at dinner this new year. And it warms my heart when my kids love what I make for dinner. But even better than them actually eating it all is the fact that EveryPlate is budget-friendly. So if you're looking to budget your food expenses this February, save big and eat great with America's best value meal kit, EveryPlate. Their meals are cheaper than your average fast casual meal. It's the easiest way to eat affordably. I mean, I don't know about you, but every time I leave the grocery store, I wonder if I left behind a bag or 10 because the receipt is always so high. Anyway, this year, EveryPlate has made dinner time less stressful for me. And with 26 tasty meals to choose from a week, it's easy to gin something right up in about 30 minutes. Last week, the girls and I enjoyed saucy chicken and pepper stir fry, as well as the creamy tomato and pork sausage linguine. And when I tell you that I saw my middle child licking her fingers, I knew we found some meals we would be repeating in the very near future. With every plate, you don't just get variety for dinner, but you can also choose from over 25 convenient sides, breakfast items, lunches, snacks, desserts, and more. Oh, and did I mention the $1 steaks? Yes, right now you can take advantage of $1.49 meals plus $1 steaks for life by visiting everyplate.com slash podcast and using my code, the number 49 military M-A-M-A. Subscription must be active to qualify and redeem $1 steaks. Visit everyplate.com slash podcast and use my code 49 military mama for $1.49 meals plus $1 steaks for life. Enjoy. Tina Leake, Sherry Malarick's older sister, was interviewed, and she told authorities that Sherry had confided in her after her Greece deployment that Greg had been having an affair with the babysitter slash coworker. Yup, our girl Jennifer Spone. Sherry had asked Tina not to tell anyone because Sherry was trying to make her relationship work. But Sherry told Tina that she was oblivious to the extramarital affair until one day when Greg and Sherry got into a screaming match. After the argument, Sherry's little daughter, who was three years old at the time, walked into the room and asked Sherry why daddy didn't love her anymore, meaning why daddy didn't love mommy anymore. Sherry assured the little girl that daddy did love mommy, but the little girl responded, daddy doesn't love you anymore. He loves Jennifer now. Sherry was floored. What in the world was she listening to? I imagine that Sherry probably felt like the rug had been ripped from under her. Tina said, though, that Sherry was a woman of faith. She loved her life. She loved her family. And she felt that this affair was just a bump in the road. But it wasn't just the little girl's words that confirmed that there was an affair. Sherry had seen Jennifer in Greg's office on multiple occasions and once, at least once, even saw them exiting the elevator while holding hands. 
Tina never believed that Sherry made a big deal about it because she was trying to win her husband back. The month before her murder, Sherry and Greg even went on a little getaway alone. Sherry was intent on winning her husband's affection back. Tina told authorities that she was sure this affair had something to do with Sherry's murder. When investigators heard this, a lot of things started to make sense. I mean, who returns a lawnmower at 9 p.m. on a Friday? Unless, of course, the person is your next door neighbor. It's, it really is interesting timing. But what are the odds? Your mistress shows up 90 minutes or so after your wife is last seen and then turns up dead the next morning. Investigators also learned from 11-year-old Jacob that while his mom was deployed, Jennifer was initially just their babysitter and she would arrive and depart when the dad needed a sitter. But eventually, she started hanging around the house a little bit more and more and would sometimes even spend the night. One night, Jacob recalled walking out into the living room after bedtime and seeing Jennifer and Greg laying on the floor cuddling with a bottle of wine nearby. With all this information, the lead detective brought Jennifer Spohn in for questioning, and when they confronted her about the affair, she was straightforward with them. Yep, I was sleeping with Greg Malarick, but I had nothing to do with Sherry's murder. She admitted her fingerprints would be all over that minivan, since that was one of their many locations where her and Greg would meet to have sex. But other than that, she swore up and down she knew absolutely nothing. Greg, well, he stopped answering questions altogether. And in fact, not just had he stopped answering the police's questions, he refused to talk to the media, which is really odd. In my research, I went back to historic newspaper articles from the time of Sherry's death, and I found it so strange that he declined to comment about his wife's passing. I found an article dated October 26, 2001, just shy of five weeks from the day of Sherry's murder. The article starts off with comments from Reverend Jim Harris, the pastor of Milestone Baptist Church, where Sherry was a member. The article was raising awareness about Sherry's unsolved murder and discussed the $5,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. It was $4,000 that had been provided by the family and $1,000 that had been provided by Crime Stoppers. Sherry's sisters commented about Sherry's devotion to the family. The pastor discussed Sherry's devotion to the church. And Greg? Well, the statement in the newspaper read, quote, Greg Malarick, who is now raising the family's four boys and one girl, declined to comment, end quote. It went on to say that Greg, quote, a civilian employed by the Department of Defense, he has not spoken publicly about his wife's death, end quote. As investigators searched the Malarick home, they discovered something else. Sherry's purse, while initially thought to have been stolen, it was found at the Malarick house in a dresser. Inside the purse was Sherry's driver's license and all of her credit cards. The question is, why would Sherry leave to the grocery store without all her stuff? In 2002, authorities brought Jennifer Spohn back in for questioning, but this time she refused to talk. And I failed to mention this earlier, but Sherry was killed off base, so the civilians were primary on the investigation. But because it involved military personnel, the entire love triangle, that is, NCIS was also involved in the investigation. Sadly, Sherry Malarick's murder went cold, and three years after her murder, the reward money went up to $10,000. The Pensacola News Journal published an article on November 24, 2003, which said, quote, Help sought rewards totaling $10,000 are being offered for information leading to a conviction in the September 2001 homicide of Sherry Malarick. Her body was found in her maroon 1996 Dodge Caravan at the Winn-Dixie store on US-29 in Gonzales on September 22nd. Call Crime Stoppers, end quote. Again, at that time, when the news journal sought comment from Greg, he didn't return their calls. And all this seems suspicious, you know? At the time of the murder, 11-year-old Jacob also recalled that soon after he learned of his mom's death, Greg brought all the kids out into the living room and he basically said, now that mom is gone, people are going to come around and they're going to want to ask questions. We don't talk about it. Family business is family business. The thing is that sadly, many of Sherry's family found it suspicious as hell. 
especially since Greg Malarick and Jennifer Spohn continued their relationship after Sherry's death. But wait, before I get to that story, let me tell you about that time that Sherry's sister Tina and her husband Jeff brought balloons to the kids for Mother's Day 2002. Well, when they showed up with balloons, Greg was pissed. As heard on Dateline, Greg came out the back door screaming and hooting and hollering, yelling at them to never show up at their house without asking for permission first. Apparently, Greg was upset because he believed that his in-laws had reported him for child abuse. Sadly, while Tina said she never reported Greg for child abuse, the child abuse allegations were in fact true. Jacob, the oldest son, stated that the child abuse was worse while his mom was deployed. He said that Greg had a very violent temper, grabbing the kids by the hair and dragging them through the house. Greg also punched and kicked holes in the wall. This made them terrified. And when they learned their mom was never coming home again, it made them even more scared. The two oldest boys found it suspicious that their mom was murdered, and they found it odd that she went out for milk because when she went outside, she never told them she was going to the grocery store. But the kids could never confide in anyone but each other. And the thing about it was that almost as soon as Sherry was murdered, Jennifer Spohn became a staple in their house. And the kids did not take kindly to that because she wasn't their mom and she was never going to replace their mom. Even the baby, Tara, who was three when her mom died, she didn't take fondly to Jennifer after her own mom died. Decades later, Tara recalled on Dateline that Jennifer worked diligently around the Malarick house to dispose of all the memories of Sherry. And Jennifer would often take anything belonging to Sherry to her daughter Tara's room and ask her if she wanted to keep those items in her room rather than out in the open. But wait, the relationship between Jennifer Spohn and Greg Malarick was odd. For starters, she was always around, but it took eight whopping years for Jennifer to officially move into the Malarick house with her own kids. Tara recalled all the kids having to rearrange the house to make room for Jennifer and her two sons. Tara would have been 11 years old when Jennifer moved in, and Jacob, the oldest, would have been 19 and out of the house by that point. The thing about all this is that Jennifer and her kids only lived in the house for three months before moving out. But Jennifer and Greg Malarick continued their relationship. Jennifer would later say that she only lasted three months in the house because being around all those kids was just too much. But sadly, behind the scenes, Sherry Malarick's murder case was not only cold, it was stale as hell. That is, until 2017, when the case got a fresh new look. The NCIS cold case team looked at the case and together with a local detective, Wayne Wright, they went back to the case file and started listening in on all the recordings of the witness interviews starting with everything the kids said. The new investigators picked up on the fact that Greg Malarick allegedly took a shower that night and changed his clothes, which was uncommon for him. This was information one of the kids gave. Another thing they picked up on was the description of a gun given by one of the children. One child described a small gun in the house. The gun was so small it could fit in the palm of your hand. And apparently, this was a gun that Greg got at a gun show about a month prior to Sherry's death. But investigators never found that gun, which they revealed could have been the 25 caliber gun used to kill Sherry. And then one of the other kids, cousin Lisa, she recalled being in the house and hearing a pop sound come from outside. Investigators now wondered if it was the sound of a gunshot. At that point, investigators believed they had enough circumstantial evidence but it was a very slim case against Greg Malarick. In 2020, investigators learned that Greg and Jennifer had split up and Jennifer moved out of the state to Illinois. So they somehow got her down to her local police station. She had no idea what she was there for. And then they told her they wanted to talk to her about a 2001 cold case. And immediately, Jennifer Spohn knew what they wanted to talk to her about. They got right into it. They wanted to know why Jennifer showed up at 9 p.m. with the lawnmower, right before Sherry's death. 
She was like, I was just restless that night and I showed up out of the blue. They asked her if she thought it possible that Greg was involved in Sherry's murder. Her response? Well, it's always possible, she said. But other than that, she didn't give them anything else. 19 years and counting, an affair, a murder, a breakup. And Jennifer said she knew nothing. But the detectives figured they wouldn't get any closer to solving the case. So with all the circumstantial evidence they had, the prosecutor agreed to press charges. In 2020, Greg Malarick, now 57 years old, was arrested and charged with the second degree murder of his wife. Upon learning about the arrest, Sherry's family was ecstatic. They couldn't believe their ears. They knew all along that Greg killed Sherry. Now they might finally get justice for their sister. But when you look at it, it was a skimpy case. With charges filed, detectives returned to Jennifer Spone and they were like, listen, girl, charges have come out. You know something. Now is your time to talk. And it was then and only then with that realization and the fact that detectives were never going to stop searching for answers in the death of Sherry Malarick that Jennifer agreed to talk, but only with immunity. Oh boy, what is she about to say? Well, Jennifer got that immunity. So regardless of what she said, she could never be prosecuted in the death of Sherry Malarick, which is always a tough choice for prosecutors. During her interview, Jennifer said that the affair started innocently enough. She was really the babysitter. But one night after Greg got home from work, the kids were asleep. They went into the kitchen, poured a glass of wine, and one thing led to the next. And voila, she had sex with a married man. But wait. During her interview with Dateline, Jennifer had the audacity to say she didn't realize he was married, (laughs) which is kind of funny, right? Now, Andrea Canning, who is an NBC correspondent and she's on Dateline. Well, if you didn't know this, she's married to a Marine. During this interview, Andrea Canning is like, come on now, you didn't know he was married with all them kids? Or maybe it's that you were trying to pretend not to know. I mean, this interview really fired me up. It really fired Andrea Canning up. But anyway, during this Dateline interview, we learned that when Jennifer met Greg, she was divorced with a son and was pregnant with another man's baby. She was also supporting her mom and her sister. So, you know, why not start an affair with a married man with five kids, right? Jennifer basically admitted that she didn't care too much about the wife and the affair didn't end when Sherry returned from Greece. She said that Greg Malarick, married three times, didn't want to go through another divorce. So he was the one that voiced to Jennifer that the easiest thing to do to get Sherry out of the picture was to kill her. As in every case I ever tell you about, Jennifer thought that Greg was joking, but he kept bringing it up. And then one day, out of the blue, she claims that he told her to meet her at the Winn-Dixie parking lot at 7 p.m. So she showed up, he got into the car, and they left. Jennifer said she had no idea what he had just done, but he was wearing a wig. He instructed her to drive slowly. He took the wig off and tossed it out the window, and she just followed all his instructions and drove him home. Once at the house, he told her to stay outside for a few minutes and then knock on the door to return the lawnmower, because this would serve as an alibi. Once Jennifer knocked on the door, one of the kids answered and Greg came to the door. When Jennifer met Greg, he gave her some bags and clothes and instructed her to get rid of them. Jennifer immediately drove around and tossed the bag into a body of water off a bridge. She said the gun was in that bag, but she never touched it. Once authorities knew this, they searched the body of water where Jennifer said she tossed the gun, but they never found it. Now, mind you, She said she tossed this gun in 2001 and they were now searching in what, like 2020, 2021? Regardless, the case went forward and now with Jennifer Spohn's statement, the charge was upgraded to first degree murder. The prosecutor knew it was an uphill battle against Greg Malarick, but she felt she had enough for the conviction. Greg's trial started in 2022 and lasted four days. The older of the two kids testified about what they heard all those years prior. Jennifer Spohn also testified. 
The prosecutor said that Sherry died because her husband was having an affair. He used the cover of a sleepover party with seven kids to distract the kids, kill Sherry, dispose of her body, and no one would be none the wiser. The prosecutor called this the perfect alibi. A group of seven kids enjoying their first sleepover with their cousins. The prosecutor had also dug up some email communication between Greg and Jennifer, where two months prior to Sherry's death, Greg sent Jennifer a link to an article describing how to beat a lie detector test. At this trial, the jury deliberated for two hours, and then word came back to the judge that the jury was deadlocked. The judge instructed them to keep going, and they did. But at the end of the day, they couldn't come to a unanimous decision. The result? A hung jury. Secretly, jurors would reveal it was a 10 to 2 vote to convict, but due to the two holdouts, they were hung. When the result of the jury trial is hung, the prosecutor must decide what to do. Do they drop charges and call it a day? Do they reduce the charge and hope for a plea deal? Or do they leave everything as is and proceed to a second trial? In this case, the prosecutor felt strongly that they needed to proceed to a second trial. And that trial would take place in the fall of 2023, 22 years after Sherry's murder. Can you imagine the youngest daughter? She was three years old at the time of the murder. And now during this second trial, she was 25 years old. At this second trial, we heard many of the things we already heard. The prosecutor laying out the case that Greg Malarick called Sherry outside. He somehow got her into the passenger side of the minivan where he shot her, the kids inside, at least little cousin Lisa hearing what she thought was a bottle rocket. The second oldest son testified that after Sherry's murder, he saw his father out back using a metal detector and digging into the ground. The prosecutor argued that Greg was looking for the missing shell casing in the backyard. And one fact that came out in the second trial that didn't come out in the first trial was when Jennifer Spohn testified that Greg told her he had to shoot Sherry twice because after the first shot, she was still alive and he was already committed to her death. So he shot her a second time. Prosecutors argued about the affair and they also argued about the windfall of life insurance money that Greg stood to get if his wife was dead which was a little over $260,000 once it was paid out. But Greg's defense attorney did something during the second trial that he hadn't in the first trial. He offered up an alternative murderer, Jennifer Spohn herself. The defense attorney was like, hello, she wanted Sherry's life. Sherry was trying to win her man back and Jennifer was not about that life. Why now? Why did Jennifer Spohn change her story now, two decades later, almost immediately after things between her and Greg didn't work out? She's a liar, liar, pants on fire, changing her story depending on who she's talking to. The defense attorney also pointed to the lackluster investigation, basically saying they were a bunch of clowns who got tunnel vision. And then a new witness at the second trial was Greg and Sherry's youngest child, Tara. She was three, as I mentioned, when Sherry was killed, but in 2023, she was in her mid-20s. The defense attorney used her testimony to show the family dynamics, that over the years, Sherry's sisters had basically coaxed the kids into believing that Greg Malarick killed their mother. Tara also testified about Jennifer Spohn and Jennifer's hatred for Sherry, even after her death. And that, the defense counsel said, showed that even after Sherry was dead, Jennifer Spohn had a bone to pick with Sherry. Jennifer Spohn wanted Sherry Malarick's life, so she took it. That was the defense's argument to the jury. But the defense didn't just point to Jennifer as the shooter. He put a giant hole in the prosecutor's case when he brought back the Winn-Dixie employee who heard a loud argument in the parking lot that night. The Winn-Dixie employee actually recalled hearing a loud pop sound. Ah, there you have it. The defense argued Sherry was actually killed in the Winn-Dixie parking lot, not at the house. So the children witnesses, well, they must have been hearing things. 
That when Dixie employee also said that without a shadow of the doubt, it was not Greg Malarick that he saw in the Win Dixie parking lot that night. Boom. The defense was done. But was that enough reasonable doubt? The jury deliberated for nine long hours, and when they returned, their verdict was not guilty. Sherry's family was devastated, with Greg off the hook for Sherry's murder with a full acquittal and Jennifer Spone having full immunity, no one would ever be held responsible for Sherry's murder. During the Dateline episode called The Sleepover, Andrea Canning asked Greg's defense attorney if he thought his client was innocent. The defense attorney said, quote, from a legal standpoint, yes, end quote. Sadly, there will never be justice for Sherry. But all these years later, she will continue to be remembered for her love of music, dancing, and being an amazing mom. There is no doubt in my mind that if Sherry were still alive today, she would be an uber popular minimalist mom giving loads of advice about meal prepping for large families. Whenever I saw her picture online as I was researching, Sherry Malarick had this big, beautiful smile, and she really just looked like mom of the year. I cannot imagine being separated from my kids for an entire year. But Sherry Malarick survived that long deployment, and even despite learning of her husband's affair, Sherry felt that she wanted to work it out for her family. She didn't want to rock the boat. Sadly, for her husband's affair, Sherry Malarick paid with her life. In watching Jennifer Spone in her first ever TV interview during the Dateline episode, I didn't feel that Jennifer was remorseful, not even a little bit. She just felt really cold. And to top it off, she never apologized. She simply said, well, I can't take it back. What in the world? I've heard an apology like that before, and it's simply a cop out for a coward. May Sherry Malarick rest in peace, and I pray that her children will one day find peace among each other. Today, I want to give a shout out to my listener who I met at CrimeCon last year, who reminded me about this case and recommended it to me. And shout out always to my girl Myrtle for always keeping me on my toes with the latest true crime episodes involving military murder. It was just last week that Myrtle was like, hey, did you see that it was covered on Dateline? And that's how I got here today. So listen, keep writing in with your case recommendations because every week I go to that recommendation list and I pick a new case to cover. And if you have ever thought to yourself, hmm, how can I support Mama Margo and Military Murder Podcast? Then listen, if you've ever thought that, maybe you should consider leaving a review. And if you have room in your budget, subscribe to my Patreon or Apple Premium where for as little as $5, you will get access to 40 full-length bonus episodes and a new bonus episode every month. My sources for today's case include an episode of Dateline titled The Sleepover, as well as articles in Pensacola News Journal, NBC News, ABC News, and Find a Grave. Military Murder is a Mama Margot production. This episode's executive producers are Myrtle, Falcon 13, Tina, Jen, and Nicole. Our newest Patreon assistant producer is Jamie. The theme music was created by Tyops. Until next time, remember, you never really know what someone is capable of, so remain vigilant always. You have a fabulous week, and I'll keep digging to bring you another military murder story next week. working on our podcast. I don't want to.